Nietzsche asserts that life, in a biological sense, is the will to power, and if we take him up on this claim, then life is necessarily always ascendant or descendant, either gaining power, gaining vitality, increasing in strength and potency, or losing power and becoming more sickly and feeble, aiming towards death. We can see this in the individual life cycle of an organism. When an organism is young, it grows, it increases its power, it learns to dominate its environment, it reproduces, expands, conquers, and this increase in power, this growth of life, takes place on the very level of the cell, but eventually that same organism begins to break down, it can no longer resist entropy, it begins to decline and grows old and feeble, it stops expanding and begins shrinking. Life is always waxing or waning, and it follows that an organism must always either be gaining or losing life, becoming more alive or closer to death, ascending or descending. Whatever this strange thing that we call life is, it comes in degrees of intensity, and as far as we know, has no limit to its upper potential. And now Nietzsche's idea of the Ubermensch and the last man is revealed to us more fully. The Ubermensch represents a more full expression of life and power, while the last man represents a decline of life and power. Thus, the Ubermensch represents a type of progress, not towards a moral utopia or the taming and domestication of man, this type of progress is represented by the last man, but towards the fullest expression of nature. And what do we mean by nature? The same which we mean by life and by the will to power. Nature is the force within biological life, synonymous with life, synonymous with the Greek phusis which, as Kostin Alamario demonstrates in his work, describes the living body, vegetative life, and one's inner nature or vitality as expressed most fully by heroes and athletes. This was the Greek conception of nature. And this nature, this vital force, is what we see shining forth from great men and heroes, whose lives, whose very being, represent an attempt at overcoming man. And it is this thing, nature, life, fusis, which even scientists fail to quantify or define, which separates living things from inanimate ones, which separates life from death, and which drives life again and again in spite of time, death, and countless mass extinctions towards increasingly complex and powerful forms. Now that we have come to an understanding of what nature truly is, what life truly is, we have refuted the liberal worldview and all related worldviews which posit the taming of man, the moralization of the beast in man, as the ultimate good. When we see the true essence of nature and life, we see that what is good is all that brings an increase in vitality, which is a proxy for this thing which we call life. And this frame allows us to understand why Nietzsche says that cruelty, suffering, even death is sometimes necessary for life, for the improvement and heightening of life, and why he makes the bold claim that moral progress represents decline because it represents an attempt to tame man and thus remove all of his vital elements, an attempt to sterilize all of the violent and lustful instincts which are manifestations of man's will to power. Morality itself, then, whether Christian or liberal, can be understood as a sign of decline. But if we throw away all moralities which advocate for the taming of man, for the restraint and dilution of man's vitality, then what value system should we adopt? What prevents us from becoming unrestrained savages and turning civilization into the war of all against all? The answer is actually quite simple. The idea of nature, as I have described it, originated with the Greeks and was tied directly with the idea of heroism as I outlined earlier. 
For the Greeks, nature was not a paradise from which we fell. Man began in a lowly state, without fire, without light, without reason, without beauty, until Prometheus gave man fire and the arts of civilization, the arts of the gods. For the Greeks, the gods represented a state of perfected nature, of pure, eternal, vital, undying youth, and terrible beauty and power. And the task of man was to strive towards that divinity, and to become godlike in that striving. And this was, for the Greeks, the purpose of civilization, to elevate man towards the higher and towards the gods. And their heroes, these higher men, these overmen, who were born with an inner nature, a superhuman fusis, which drove them towards glory, triumph, and even towards their own destruction, were the heralds of this higher state of being. The idea of nature, as first understood and named by the Greeks, implies the heroic worldview and the heroic moral system. Heroism is the beautification of nature, the beautification of the natural. In order to allow life to attain its fullest expression, it must be channeled through specific outlets. It must be disciplined. Comfort, laxity, and the lack of struggle and challenge leads to a weakening of life, even for the strongest nature. Excellence requires discipline and direction, just as the attainment of a muscular and beautiful physique requires a rigorous and directed workout routine. This is why the Greek hero was directly tied with the athlete. Both channeled their explosive animalistic inner nature through directed outlets to achieve a heightened state of being which touched the divinity of the gods themselves through their superhuman heroic and athletic feats. In the heroic view, then, life can be seen as a game in which we impose rules and codes of conduct for the purpose of beautifying the raw material of nature, the raw energies of life, and directing them towards the higher. As it is on the sports field, so it is on the battlefield, and so it is in the realm of morality. Pagan heroic morality is not based upon the idea of moral progress or the moral soul. It does not claim that the world is a battleground between good and evil, and that the individual should strive for moral perfection. European pagan morality is based upon codes of honorable and heroic conduct, which seek to channel life towards the higher and to create excellence. In the pagan morality found in Homer, Norse literature, and the Arthurian romances, we see something natural, an ethic which supports and strengthens life. We intuitively sense a health, vibrance, and vitality in their cultures, which is lacking in the moralism of modern liberalism and conservative Christianity. In them, the air is stale and smells of decadence and decline. They represent a turning away from and a smothering of life, a rejection of life's most basic instincts. And what's beautiful is that, while all of this may seem obscure, and the journey that it took me and would take anyone to break free from the modern liberal worldview, especially without falling into the trap of the very same worldview disguised as Christian conservatism, may seem long and arduous. We have thousands of years of culture and literature to support our worldview. From the Greeks and before them with the rituals and beliefs of the Indo-Europeans, through every heroic culture which followed, and the art, literature, and heroes which they produced, the grandest and most momentous civilizational project, the heroic project, has thundered onwards. And how might we understand the spirit of this project? Dominique Venner puts it best. Quote, with Homer, the future takes root in the memory of the past. This memory leaves us a triad in which to tie our souls and our conducts. Nature as basis, excellence as goal, beauty as horizon.
This video is an excerpt from the ARC's exclusive podcast. For the full 30-minute episode and access to a private Telegram community, check the links in the description. Thank you for your support. It makes this channel possible.